Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to the Lord's House for Worship. Is it possible that our almighty and infinite God actually loves and cares personally and individually for you? Well, today in God's word, God himself assures us that that's not only possible, it's true. And he's proved that love and care for us in the greatest of ways by sending his son to rescue us from our sins. So today we rejoice in that love that God has for us, and we also rejoice in the opportunity that we have to share that love with the individuals around us. So with that focus in mind today, let's worship according to the order of service that's printed for you in the service folder. We'll turn to page two, and we'll begin with the gathering rite that is printed there. God bless us today as he feeds us with his word. depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. O Lord, have mercy on me. Our righteous God demands that we obey him perfectly, but we have not done so. Therefore, let us humbly and honestly confess our sins to God. O Lord, we have heard and seen we have failed to obey them. Forgive us for the sins we have committed in ignorance and arrogance. Forgive us for the sins we foolishly cling to. Forgive us for our faithless thoughts and intentions. For all these, we deserve nothing but your punishment. We ask you to have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Forgive our sins and spare us from the heard our prayers for mercy because of our Savior Jesus. He lived a perfect life so that we stand before God innocent of all our sins. He suffered and died on the cross so that we are no longer condemned sinners but redeemed children. He rose again on the third day so that we can have the confidence that we too will rise again and celebrate eternity in heaven. All this our Savior has done for us. Therefore, because of Jesus, we are at peace with God, and our sins are gone. Thanks be to God. Put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. With him is full redemption. He has redeemed us from all our sins.
Let us pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first lesson for this morning is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. This will also serve as the basis for our sermon this morning. We read, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This is the word of the Lord. We respond with the psalm of the day. We'll sing that together as a congregation. Thank you. 
our second lesson this morning, 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, teaches us that God does have great love for each individual person, love so great that it makes us his children. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This too is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, even the very hairs of your head are all numbered, so don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Alleluia. Our gospel lesson this morning, we again hear of God's love for us. Jesus reminds us of that love and urges us to cling to it, remain in it, and share it with others. Please stand. The gospel according to St. John chapter 15. Glory be to you, O Lord. As the Father has loved me, so, I, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in, in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You may be seated as we join in confessing our Christian faith through the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We continue with the hymn of the day.
grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The words of God we get to consider before us today are our words from our first lesson from Acts chapter 8. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, when I consider your heavens, King David wrote in Psalm 8, and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you, God, have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Have you ever wondered about that same thing? Do you understand what King David was contemplating in that psalm? He was thinking about the the vastness of our universe, about the mind-blowing vastness of our universe, about the creation that God himself had made, the heavens that he created, and about the moon and the stars and all the other heavenly bodies that, that he himself set in place, the psalm says, with his own fingers. And, and as King David thought about the vastness of it all, he then also thought about himself and about the rest of mankind. What is man that you are mindful of him? I mean, we are just these tiny little specks on earth, and the earth is just a tiny little speck in the universe. So what are we, God, that you actually think about and care about us? David was asking those questions before they even had telescopes. I mean, he probably didn't even know that our sun is just one star in a galaxy filled with a, a thousand million stars, and that our galaxy is just one galaxy in a sea of, well, what are the astrophysicists saying these days, two trillion? Two trillion galaxies, each with a thousand million stars, and one of those stars in one of those galaxies has this tiny little speck called Earth circling around it, and on that tiny little speck is a tiny little speck called you. When I consider your heavens, what is man that you are mindful of him? What am I that you are mindful of me? Ever wonder about some of the same things as King David? Or maybe here's a different way to ask it. Does the mind-blowing vastness of it all ever make you feel really, really unimportant and small? It's not just the vastness of the universe that can make us think that way. Sometimes it happens even when we think about our place here on the earth. I mean, you are just one of over seven billion and completely unrecognizable and honestly probably rather unimportant to almost all of them, but maybe a select few. Most of them don't know your name or really even care. Most of them don't know your problems or really even care. Most of them don't know your hobbies, your talents, the things that you're striving for, the things that you've accomplished, the things that you really care about, the things that make you tick. And yes, I'll say it again, most of them probably don't even care. So does that too ever make you feel really, really unimportant and small? Well, Christians, if you've ever felt that way, come along with me today as we study Acts chapter 8. Because today, your God, the God who created all of those galaxies, the God who created all of those stars, the God who created this earth and all the other people in it, the God who created you. Today, that God has a message for you, and that message is this that you are important to him. My dear brothers and sisters, and actually, maybe I should say it this way. 
you, my dear brother, and you, my dear sister, you are not small to God. Now to imagine the Ethiopian that we meet in the text before us today was probably feeling pretty small. He was an important official, Luke tells us, in charge of all the treasury of the Kendake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. I know that sounds like a, a pretty high-profile job, doesn't it? I mean, this guy worked in the palace of the queen. So, probably got paid pretty well. Probably had a, a pretty nice house of his own. Almost certainly associated with the most important people in all the land. In fact, God tells us specifically that this man was an important official. Doesn't seem to be all that much small about that. But look deeper, because what a person looks like on the outside often isn't a very good indicator of how they're feeling on the inside. First of all, this man's job came with a price. You see, in order to work in the palace of the queen, you had to become a eunuch. And if you don't know what a eunuch is, well, let's just say the queen wouldn't have to worry about a eunuch establishing a coup to overthrow her so he could put his own family line on the throne. A eunuch couldn't have a family. And so that meant no family to go home to in that big house every night. It meant no family Christmas mornings, no family dinners, no little ones to wake them up every morning with their hugs and their kisses. And it wasn't just that. Think now about where this man was. He was traveling home on a lonely desert road from worship in Jerusalem, Luke tells us. As an African who had visited Israel, he maybe felt quite a bit out of place. He would have spoken differently. He would have looked different. He probably didn't know anybody. And now, here he is, traveling back home on this lonely, isolated desert road, reading the scriptures without a whole lot of understanding of what he was reading. Can you imagine all of the really important questions that would have been flowing through his mind? at this time. Questions about God, questions about himself, questions about his salvation, and about his place in God's plan for the universe. Can you picture him asking all of those questions, trying to make sense of these important things that he was reading, but not really knowing why it was important? Is it possible that this important official in charge of all the treasury of the queen, is it possible that in this moment, he was feeling really, really unimportant and small. Well, it was at that moment that our God, the God who created all those galaxies, the God who created all those stars, the God who created the earth and all the other people in it, it was at that moment that our God decided to jump into this individual's life in a really big way to let him know, nope, you're not. You are not at all small to me. Our God sent him that message through a pastor named Philip, a man who was sent directly by God, we're told, to, well, to tell this one lonely individual soul on this lonely desert road leading to Africa about Jesus. The Spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, verse 30 says, and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. And so together they looked at what he was reading. It happened to be from Isaiah chapter 53, a very beautiful prophecy that spoke very beautifully about Jesus. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, Isaiah wrote. And as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. 
In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? As they read those words together, the eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Well, Philip's heart must have been racing with excitement to tell this individual soul who was desperate for answers about his Savior. Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Can you imagine the conversation that would have gone on from there? This Ethiopian got his own personal Bible information class right there from Pastor Philip in the back of that chariot. And all of it centered on the good news about Jesus. You see, Philip could have explained to him the sheep that Isaiah is talking about here. That's Jesus. He was the one who was led to the slaughter. He died on a cross in Jerusalem where you just were just a few months ago. His was the life that was taken from the earth, but his death was not in vain. In fact, that was the plan because when he died, he was paying the price for your sins. And that means you, dear eunuch, through faith in Jesus. It means all of your sins are completely gone. They're forgiven because of what Jesus has done for you. And where your sins are forgiven, you have life with God now and forever. It was the good news about Jesus. And this Ethiopian had never heard it before. Would God really do all of that for me? You can just hear the eunuch asking after Philip got done talking. And then Philip could have said, yeah, he would. Of course he would, because he loves you just that much. In fact, not only would he, he already did. He did because you are not small to God. A simple baptism later, and that eunuch went on his way rejoicing, Luke tells us. And why wouldn't he? Assured of the forgiveness of his sins and the life that he now had with God because of what Christ had done for him, he now knew that he, him, his personal and individual soul, he now knew that he was not small to God. Christians, when you consider your individual place in the universe, when you consider all the other people in our world and what they may or may not know about you, and how much they may or may not even care. It is so, so easy to feel so, so unimportant and so, so small. Which is exactly why your God, the God who created all those galaxies and all those stars and our earth and all the other people in it, that's why your God shares stories like this one with you in Scripture. It's because he wants you to know and to be assured that he feels the exact same way about you that he did about this one lonely individual soul on this lonely desert road leading to Africa. And do you know how I know that? It's because what God did for this lonely soul on this lonely desert road leading to Africa, he's also done for you. He has opened up your eyes to the good news about Jesus. He's literally doing it right now. And he is assuring you that the good news about Jesus that you hear in his word, he assures you in his word that it is for you. And not just for you, plural. It's for you, personally, individually, you, singular. Jesus lived for you. Jesus died 
for you. Jesus rose for you. You, too, were connected to Jesus and everything that he's done for you in the waters of your baptism. That happened personally to you. And that means the forgiveness that Christ won and the life with God that Christ won. That means all of those blessings are for you. They're for you because you are just that important to God. Even if you were the only person on earth, God still would have done all that for you. He still would have done it because you are not small to God. You're not the only person on earth. If you were, God still would have done all that because he loves you and cares for you just that much. But there are, of course, other people on earth in addition to you. So let's talk about them today, too. And as we talk about them, let's also shift our focus to the other man that we hear about in this Acts chapter 8 story. Because as beautiful as it is to be the hearer of the good news about Jesus, which all of you individually are, God also gives us the opportunity, gives you the opportunity to be the sharer of the good news about Jesus. So let's also focus our attention on Philip, who got to be God's sharer of the good news about Jesus. Philip, at least up until this point, was the pastor of a church in Samaria, which was a region about 50 miles north of Jerusalem. And Philip's church in Samaria, well, it was booming. Ever since Pentecost, it was booming. Luke tells us in the first half of Acts chapter 8 that Luke got to preach to huge crowds in Samaria, sharing the good news about Jesus with thousands of people. In fact, Philip's mission church in Samaria was growing so rapidly that the apostles Peter and John had to leave what they were doing in Jerusalem for a while just to travel up north to help Philip with the workload. So, can you imagine Philip's surprise then? When God called him to leave that booming harvest field so that he could go and share the good news about Jesus with one lonely soul on that lonely desert road leading to Africa. God was teaching Philip something through that call. Do you see it? He was teaching Philip that his ministry, no matter how many thousands he had the opportunity to work with, he was teaching Philip that his ministry was still about each individual soul. And you know what? Philip got the message. Isn't his response amazing? There's no disappointment. There's no questioning. There's no hesitation or talking back. I've got a really good thing going here, God, and now you want me to leave the many so that I can go and preach to the one? No, there is none of that. Instead, all we see from Philip is simple obedience. The Spirit told him to go, and so he went. In fact, he didn't just go. Luke tells us he ran. Willing obedience, joyful obedience. God, I love to do your will obedience. Like a, a little kid running after the ice cream truck, Philip ran after that chariot because he knew that the man inside was not small to God. That lonely soul on that lonely desert road leading to Africa needed to hear about his Savior. And God, in his grace, decided to use one man, Philip, to do it. Because that's how God does his kingdom work. His huge, vast, historical kingdom work 
God does it one individual soul at a time. So, who are the souls in your life that need to know they're not small to God? In fact, let's make this just as personal as God does. Who is the soul in your life that needs to know they're not small to God? Who is the soul that needs to know that the good news about Jesus is for them too? Maybe you'll get a chance to explain Isaiah 53 to them in the back of a chariot. Or maybe your opportunities are going to be far less dramatic than that. Maybe it's just going to be the classmate that you sit next to in school every day. Maybe it's just the neighbor who waves to you as you leave every morning. Maybe it's just that coworker who works down the hall from you, or just your friend from the gym, or just the man or woman that you married, or just the child that God has blessed you with. Whoever it is, that person, that soul, that soul is so important to God that God put you in their life so that you could share the good news about Jesus with them with your words. And so that you could live the good news about Jesus with them, with your life. That person is so important to God that God placed you in their life so that they would know that they are not small to him. Because everything that the Lord has done for you in Christ, everything that he did for Philip and for this Ethiopian, and for every, <clears throat> every soul in the world, God has also done for them. So run to them, Christians. Run to them just as Philip ran up to this chariot. Run to them and let them know you are not small to God. Amen. Now may the peace of our God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you have a physical thank offering today, you can leave it in one of the baskets on the way out of church. We also have an electronic giving option. You can find access to that in the service folder. Also, if you're a guest of us today, you can fill out one of the connection cards. We'd love to have a record of your visit. That also can be placed in one of the offering baskets on your way out. We'll now continue our worship with the prayer of the church, followed by the Lord's Prayer on page 7. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we praise you for reconciling us to yourself through the sufferings and death of your dear Son. Through him we have confidence to enter into your presence and to bring you our prayers and petitions. Out of the infinite bounty of your goodness, grant us a rich measure of your spirit. Let the love of Christ fill your church so that it may flourish in all good works. Help us show love and compassion for all who are in need. Bestow on the nations of the earth the knowledge of your mercy that they may turn to you, the only God, and find salvation in you. Strengthen our faith so that we unfailingly come to you in prayer for all our bodily needs. Give a special measure of your power to those who are sorrowful or mourning, to those who are in pain or sickness, to those who may be in temptation or peril, that they may receive your blessed aid. And help us patiently endure any chastening and afflictions you permit to come into our lives, knowing that you are using them in love to prepare us for that joyful communion with you, which is ours for all eternity. Accept our prayers and intercessions and provide for all our needs, not because we are worthy, but for the sake of Jesus our Savior, who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We respond by singing the hymn. We pray. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll close with him.
Good morning. Thank you for joining us in worship. A few announcements to highlight this morning. First of all, thank you for everyone that came to the Everyone Outreach Seminar Friday and Saturday. Uh, I was not able to make it to yesterday's session. I was not feeling very well, so maybe don't shake my hand on the way out this morning. But Friday was amazing, and I'm sure Saturday went just as well. Uh, this coming Friday, uh, October 27th, from 4 to 6 p.m. is the Fall Festival. Uh, we are still looking for some volunteers to help out with that. Uh, there will be a link in the Zion update if you can help out with that. That would be awesome. And then looking ahead to November 5th, we will uh, have an all-school sing. And in between during the Family Bible Hour, we will have a fellowship brunch. And since all of the school families are also invited and will probably be there with the kids singing, we ask that uh, you bring some, a breakfast item or items, and if you can, please provide a double portion. Uh, that is all for this morning that I have to highlight. God bless your day.